Welcome to our Connected series. Uh, this uh, webinar is titled Rhino for Jewelry Design. It'll be presented by Darren Hawhey, who is a consultant trainer with the Belfast Metropolitan College. We also have our lovely guests, Ruth and Steve McEwen from line from NI Silver. Uh, can I just ask that everyone goes on mute and saves their questions till the end? Do drop them into the chat and we'll get to them at the end of the webinar. Thank you very much. And over to you, Darren. Thank you, Nick. So as Nick said, my name is Darren Hockey. I am one of the consultants with Belfast Met. Um, and, and just to give you a bit of a background on myself. So I worked in industry for approximately eight years. I worked in materials, I worked in manufacturing, I worked in special projects, and I also worked in tool design and jigs and fixtures design, that kind of thing. So in, in my past, I quite heavily used the likes of Pro-E, SolidWorks, Solid Edge, those kind of softwares, basically. So the, the reason why I'm telling you this, basically, if, if there's anyone in the audience that's maybe coming from a design background and uses one software for everything within that role, I would encourage you to at least give Rhino a go, basically. Um, and, and hopefully you will see some similarities throughout the presentation as to why that, that, that's relevant, basically. So the, the, the overall sort of idea of today is for me to just give you a bit of a rundown on what Rhino is, what processes link in well to Rhino, and then later on in the presentation, we're going to have a few words from Steve and Ruth. So some of the some of the main considerations you would have for choosing Rhino. Well, the first one obviously is cost, and, and it's probably the biggest one for a lot of people. So Rhino is generally aimed at architects and creatives. And, and what I mean by creatives is people outside of the likes of SolidWorks, where everything's very parametric and the software likes to know what everything is doing and how that how that will communicate with external processes like CNC Milne or CNC lathe work, that kind of thing. So SOLIDWORKS is pretty good at um, constraining you to, to what a, the likes of a CNC mill can do. But if you sort of try to create more organic shapes or more freeform type shapes, for example, um, in my opinion, SOLIDWORKS sort of struggles a bit. Um, on, the, on the other side of it as well is that SOLIDWORKS actually has a lot of features there that creatives don't really need, you know, like your, your finite element analysis, your, your flow rate analysis, um, even some of the, the, the rendering ends of the package, you know, you maybe have structural members, uh, you have uh, folded folded plate, you know, if you're working with that, you have sheet metal functions in, in SOLIDWORKS. So, like I said, the, the, the main the main thing is cost. So if we take SOLIDWORKS, for example, you 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 would be pretty much fit to pay about six thousand pounds or more for the license or sorry for the, the software itself. And then there actually is an annual license fee there as well. So that can be in the region of about fifteen, sixteen hundred pounds last time I checked. Now it's not to say that there isn't provision there for people that maybe are starting up or entrepreneurs or someone really in the, the the small to medium range in terms of company size that wishes to learn a design software. So SOLIDWORKS will, the, the will sort of give you greatly reduced packages there. And um, if you are an entrepreneur, you know, it's maybe a fifth or a sixth of the cost, for example, but gradually, uh, uh, you know, that's maybe the first year as time goes on, you'll gradually be paying a bit more for the same software. Um, uh, Perhaps a package quite closely related to, to Rhino in, in the sense that, strictly speaking, it is a 2D software. AutoCAD can be as little as £400 per year. But again, per year is the key thing there. So um, that's only for a light version. If you want the full package in, in terms of AutoCAD, it's £1,600. And again, the, these are annual subscription fees. Um, when you compare that to Rhino, it, you pay under £1,000 and that's you. And, and better still, if you have an academic email or if you're a student, for example, you can get a license for £400 less again. So you're in the £600 bracket. So really, you're you're achieving all of the design capabilities, but for a fraction of the price when it comes to Rhino. Um, and the beauty of that as well, as you can see, the, the, the license fee, cover, it covers you for life. And that includes any updates. And there are regular updates. And they'll actually tell you these within the, the app itself. Um, 
we've sort of we've discussed functionality. We've sort of touched on that at this point. Um, again, the, the key thing to, to remember here is the flexibility that Renu gives you. Um, for me personally, I, I find it's a bit of a struggle to create some shapes on, on SolidWorks. Not to say it's undoable, but Rhino doesn't really care about what exact size something is or what exact location it is, although you are able to do that using coordinate systems and this kind of thing. Um, it just feels a little bit more free thinking and sort of tailored towards the, the, the free form end of things when it comes to comes to design. And that, that fits the bill pretty well with conceptual buildings and architecture, as well as you know small jewelry items, as, as we'll go on to look at. Um, the other thing as well is the resource availability, and we'll touch on this again, but basically the, there's loads of resources out there across LinkedIn Learning. You have some of the forums um, and then just YouTube as well. There, there's any amount of people doing different designs, so you should be able to find something pretty close to what it is you need. Uh, and uh, there will be a video out there and fail not. And ideally, if you want the human touch as well, we within the college offer up skilling in these softwares as well. So. It's a worthwhile thing to do if if you're considering changing design packages or even starting up in terms of design. So I sort of spoke about some of the similarities between Rhino and AutoCAD. Uh, if, we, if we look at the, the top left images here, um, I mean, for anyone just starting out, it looks very busy in, in terms of what all those symbols mean, you know, what, what they actually do. When you compare it to the likes of AutoCAD, if you're if you're from that background and you have a little bit of experience, a lot of these functions are just the same. You have union, you have extrudes, you have, you have different shapes like circles and blocks. Uh, you have Boolean operations, the, this kind of thing. And, and the beauty of both, and that this is true for AutoCAD and Rhino, you can actually type the functions that you want to do. So if you want to cut something, just type in cut, and it'll talk. It'll take you through the operation. If you want to put a hole in something, if you want to extrude, round sweep all, all these functions are there and, and, and one thing as well that's common across the two is your constraints so if you need a midpoint a tangent an intersection line all, all these are available on rhino so to actually sit and draw 2d shapes on rhino is is near identical to autocad in my opinion so for for anyone making that crossover it, it's once you get past the user interface you you, you will settle into it quite nicely <clears throat> So off the back of that, the Rhino actually talks to a lot of other softwares, so it'll recognize a lot of the, the, the file types that you see here. So for the likes of a PDF, you may pull an image in and it'll recognize that, albeit with a plugin. And um, if you create a part on SolidWorks and you want to export it into Rhino, you can. One thing I would say is that some of these require a, a conversion software, and generally you can get these conversion softwares at little cost online, or indeed there is some free versions as well. And one that is nonetheless that's, um, that's relevant here is STL. So STL is the, the file type that creates a mesh geometry that, that speaks to the likes of 3D printers. So anything you design on Rhino can be 3D printed, and it doesn't necessarily have to initially been, been designed on Rhino. But you can open it up in that, and you should be fit to add it using the some of the options I've spoke about earlier. Okay. So some of the some of the plugins available for Rhino, and, and it's probably good to start with Pufferfish. So if if we sort of step away from the the power metric style of modeling like you would have in SolidWorks, um, you can sort of see on an X, Y, and Z scale or coordinate basis or coordinate system. You would sort of struggle to create that top right shape. The simple reason is there's curves going in obscure directions. They're um, they're, they're not fixed in any one plane, really. Mm -hmm. Is my point there? So quite an organic shape, and there's also patterns that are common across the shape of it that vary depending on the shape. Those would be very very complicated to do using traditional solid works, but with the the pufferfish uh, plugin for Rhino, this this is actually pretty achievable, and what that does. It, it implements like a flow chart style of design modeling where you have like X, Y, and Z. And this this is also the case for Grasshopper. But say your X dimension is 10, your, your Y dimension is 50, and your Z is whatever. You can actually use almost like algebra to, to, to dictate what these dimensions should be. So 
one thing that Rhino doesn't do well out of the box, I would say, is sort of tie down dimensions to what you want them to be. It, it's it's a little bit laborious, almost in the, the same way that AutoCAD would be. Although you can just type in coordinate systems and that, but I find with, with the likes of Pufferfish and Grasshopper, this is actually far easier. The, the user interface is sort of laid out better to, to achieve this. Um, and, and they use the term food for Rhino and they sort of play about with other names, new can, kangaroo vertices and stuff there. Um, so the, you'll always see these relative names when you're, when you're dealing with Rhino plugins, but in essence, Grasshopper is for creating complex shapes and patterns, really. So if, if, if you want to boost your Rhino and to be more parametric than any one of these two would do, and these are only picked out of a bunch, you know, if you get onto the forums or get onto some of the websites, the, the plugins, depending on what it is you want to do, are more or less endless. So you're bringing this, you know, four to nine hundred pound package up on terms with a package that's maybe six, seven times more expensive in the first year. Um, and then it's worth mentioning as well, Rhino does a good job of using plugins for renders. So within Rhino, you would set your, your model material. Now, Rhino off the bat, it, it, it's sort of wireframe or shaded in terms of the actual 3D render. But um, if, if you then put that in through, if you run that through a plugin, if you set the materials in each part of your design, it, it should come up pretty photorealistic. And I've just listed one there called Escape 3D Rendering. So that's just an example of one. But there, there are other more photorealistic ones that focus on like jewelry, for example, whereas this is maybe more used for architecture. And in each instance, it is feasible really to use Rhino. And if you've ever used the likes of SketchUp before, they're very, very similar. Um, and again, just, just to sort of reiterate what it said there, um, the, the forms are great. You know, everyone's had the same problems because really the, the, the biggest, I would say probably the biggest hurdle with Rhino is the user interface in the sense that it doesn't really look that user friendly and it can come across quite daunting when you initially start. So once you get past that, and again, the, you know, I mentioned LinkedIn Learning, they, they had some great one, they had some great tutorials. And that's certainly what I started off using four years ago when I first started uh, to use Rhino. So um, you have a great wealth of information online there if you do wish to get started. So what's actually pretty closely linked to um, the Rhino is the ability to use lost wax casting. So the idea being you take your design part, so that's your master design. You've designed that on CAD, you've, you've went and you've got it 3D printed in wax. So all the details there, it requires no further finishing essentially. Your next step then should be to create the mold. So you, you create a rubber mold produced from the wax original. So it's, it's actually encased in this rubber. The rubber is then heated and vulcanized basically. So this, what you have at the end of this is a flexible wax mold um, from here. And if you, if you sort of look at the, the picture three there of the apple, you can see that there's all these little channels and um, sprues they're called actually, or you could call them vents and risers if, 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 if you're familiar with uh, sand casting or die casting or anything like that. So. Essentially what this does, it provides a tree like structure and it, it allows the, the proper film of the mold. Um, so once, once you've created this and it isn't too harsh because you want to release it at the end, otherwise you just have a really pretty block. Um, so you, you heat the component, pour the wax out of it, and then you actually heat the mold itself. So there's no indifference when you go to pour molten steel into it. You know, if, if you want to pour it in cold, it would be, be a bit like pouring boiling water in a glass. You know, the, the temperature and difference would be too great and it would crack. Whereas if you maybe fill that glass with piping hot water and then poured boiling water in, you, you, you would have a better chance of the glass not cracking. And the, the, the same is true here for the for the mortar surround here. Um, so once this is dried, the, the wax is heated, or sorry, the, the mold is heated. And um, let me see. Okay, so the mold's heated to decrease the temperature difference between it and the metal, as like I said. Um, it's either poured in or put it under vacuum, basically. So 
the, the reason for all these vents and razors is to allow any air pockets to escape, not only for the main hole at the top there to allow you to pour it as an image three, but um, what you'll find is you'll have, if you didn't have these holes, you would have little pockets of air where the material didn't fill and you'll be left with imperfections in the final part. So either pour it in carefully and have the, the appropriate vent holes or put it under vacuum. And the, what the vacuum will do is bring all the bubbles to the top and that'll negate any imperfections that'll be in the, the, the last part. Um, so once your, your metal's been poured and it hardens, you remove the mold and you, you take away any of the, the sprues or the, the material left in the vent and riser holes or the main pour hole there, as you can see in image five. Now, one thing I would say is you're going to want to finish the part after this. So there is, there is still some manual input in, in terms of the in terms of the, the finished product. So you can see on slide five is quite burnished, you know, it's quite rough. Whereas on slide six, on, on the little box six there, they've, they've polished it up, they've cut all the, the sprues off, not to leave the final product. Okay. So, so when, when talking direct to print, so to actually get this initial wax mold, traditionally jewelry designers would sit have a block of wax and carve out the shape they want. As you can imagine, that would take a great amount of time and the level of detail required is actually pretty high. And not only that, you, you might need a secondary processor of the likes of a stone setter if you wish for the part to have, you know, uh, precious stones in it, for example. Uh, these are notoriously difficult to do using conventional means. So to do these by hand is pretty tricky. So a lot of jewelry designers do, they get a stone setter to come in and, and, and finish the product off for them that way. So the obvious thing there is it adds time and money into the, the product. So by using direct to print, using the likes of an SLA printer here from Form Labs, um, we do away with all this. So you can print direct to wax. There's very little waste. Any waste that is there can be reused, which is great. So it saves you starting off with that wax, you know, carving some stuff off and then it, it's sort of good for nothing. Um, in terms of printing direct to metal, if, if you look at the image on the bottom right hand side, those little skull shapes have, have been printed direct to metal. Now, the one thing I would say about those is that the finish has been added really, so that I would say that someone spent the time to sit and polish those, because generally out of a, out of the SLA printer, there can sometimes be a, like a powdered finish, almost like a sandy, a sanded look to it almost like a, like a cast part would have. So if, if you want that level of detail, you really do need to put in at least a little bit of further finishing before you create your initial mold. But obviously the beauty of directing uh, or, or printing direct to metal is that you don't need to create molds. So the idea is you have your design. If you have say a wax, a wax copy of the first one or you have the finished ring, for you to go back and change that using conventional methods would be tricky. You'd have to start from scratch. The beauty of having a CAD model is if the ring's too big or too small, it can be it can be adapted to size. If you want to change, say uh, there's text on it and you want that change to someone else's someone else's initials, you can very quickly bounce on the rhino and just change that in five minutes. So it, it saves the it saves the jeweler having to start from scratch. And that that comes in really handy, for example, if you have a jewelry item that sells really well, but it's customized to a certain extent. So you don't have to create a new mold every time you, you, you want to serve a new customer, basically. OK, so. We're going to hand over to Steve and Ruth. I believe Ruth will be speaking first. And again, that, that their company is NA Silver, a, a great company. I've, I've worked with Steve, uh, Steve being the designer and Ruth being the, the jewellery maker. Uh, I've worked with Steve for maybe the last over the last maybe six months to a year. And uh, I have to say, a, a really good wee business, and the, the, they've only went strength to strength. And I hope you enjoy their story. So, over to well, you, Ruth. Thank you, Darren. Um, lovely to be here today. Um, so, I'm Ruth from NI Silver, as Darren said. Um, we're just a wee micro business based in Hollywood and County Down. Um, we started our business because um, we were out in Malaysia for a few years. And when we were out there, we realised that there weren't very many sort of Northern Irish products out there that we could give to our expat friends. 
um, lots of shamrocks and leprechauns, but we actually wanted something to do with the iconic images in Northern Ireland. Um, so we made a little range, um, just started called My Northern Ireland, which was the mini range. So they're just like little 3D objects. But the first one that we sort of um, started to cast in wax or to make in wax was after we'd seen the Titanic Visitor Centre in Belfast. Um, and I absolutely fell in love with the facade on the outside of it. Um, and that's all I wanted to do was to carve this wee um, facade. So we made our little wax carving, um, first of all. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, I had to kind of try and find someone who could actually cast it for me. So I'd started a little silversmithing course with Belfast Met way back then as well. Um, and I managed to find a company who could cast it and actually help us generate what we wanted to do. So the, the little wax castings there that Darren was talking about in his presentation, we actually do ours a little bit different because we use the sand um, casting method rather than, you know, that the, the rubber vulcanized sort of wax method. Um, so we would make that little carving, press it into a little bit of sand um, in a little container little lid on the top, put our little holes into it and then pour the molten silver into it. And it actually forms the, the nice image there that you see on the screen. But we can make that then into necklaces, rings, charms, whatever we kind of need it for. And as Darren said, there's quite a lot of um, finishing and polishing from that casting method because it does come out quite gritty. And um, so it's quite a slow process because obviously you have to cast or carve it in wax first of all takes a few weeks and then you have to actually get it cast and then you have to finish it so we also made um, a little scrabble tar I think it's on the next slide there yep so this was another one that we carved in wax initially when we were starting to do a little piece for each of the six counties um, and we made a little like model in silver from it as well but from then, the business kind of um, has grown um, in terms of our commercial range. So we have a little piece now for each of the six counties. Um, and it's basically to give people a wee piece of home wherever they are in the world. Or for expats or whoever, visitors who have been here, they can actually take a wee piece of Northern Ireland away with them. So the business is all about um, making memories or having little memories with you wherever you are in the world. You know, and if someone's feeling a wee bit down or whatever, then they can just touch their necklace and they know they're kind of at home again. Mm -hmm. So eventually we would like to do the whole of Northern Ireland, but we haven't quite got there yet. So we will one of these days. Um, working with Belfast Met now on this new um, sort of futuristic modelling now of CAD, um, we can actually use it to actually make those little models, as Darren explained. So I'm going to hand over to Steve and he can explain to you what he did in terms of modeling and what the benefits and everything is from that. Hi, everyone. Um, so as you can see the, um, from the images of Nula with the hula, the Thanksgiving statue, um, the level of detail you can get when you start going into the 3D design world is just so much better than what we, we, we can do when Ruth's carving out of a little <laughs> bit of wax. So no, that picture or well, that image of Nula there as a necklace is very small, but you can see the eye sockets and everything. So that's kind of good. And we first approached Belfast Met to work on that project and had some mentoring with that. And now we've been currently doing schemes with them about Rhino and some of my experiences about Rhino. Well, I came to Rhino with no, uh, next slide please, Darren. Yep. Darren's laughing because he, he was there in the very beginning <laughs> and uh, it, it's it takes a while if you come to rhino with no experience of solidworks or blender or anything else just looking at the screen uh it's quite daunting so fair play to to darren for sticking with me <laughs> uh and even little things like um then we thankfully our computer was up to the task but we didn't have the right type of mouse we just had a bulk standard mouse so zooming in zooming out just was painful for both me and Darren as I was upside down on the wrong plane and trying to figure out wh wh why is my thing upside down back to front so that takes a while just to get used to. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, the college obviously for all their help um, with Nula and now trying to get us into Rhino. Um, I think one of the things you need to think about is um, you know when Ruth makes the jewellery cuts the wax and then she's in charge of it, but now she's given the baby over to me <laughs> and I'm on the computer 
eat only in the next room. And it's just like, well, you know, you have to keep talking to each other through mm -hmm. this process because otherwise I will think, well, is that what Ruth meant? And she'll come in and go, no, 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 not that. No, that needs, that jump ring needs to go that way. You know, I am not the jeweler. So I think if you do um, give the design, 3D design bit to someone else, just obviously you need to have that watertight uh, relationship as you progress through the design. Yeah. Um, Keeping a sense of humour, not only um, with Rhino, but obviously working as a husband and wife team, you need to have a sense of humour and Rhino will test you in the early days, I would suggest. Um, it's interesting. Ruth will come in and say, could you just change that or do this? And I'm like, still there two or three hours later going, I think <laughs> I can figure that out. Yeah. Where's Darren? So definitely get yourself a human mentor. You know, I had Darren to, to, to touch base with. YouTube is okay, and you can find lots of videos. Uh, I found that quite a lot of them were people using Windows machines, and the layout of the interface is slightly different. And some of them talk so fast that you'll you'll be pausing it and trying to find where the mouse went and what um, thing they did. So definitely get yourself a human mentor. Um, and I suppose another big question is for us: we're only a husband and wife team, but we decided we wanted to have this this skill base in house. But do you need Rhino in house? Are you prepared to give it the time to learn it? And it will take uh, time if, you do, if you're not coming from another background. So yeah, definitely see, do you need it you know, in-house or can you outsource it? But we wanted it in-house. And um, stick with it, you will make progress. And it, and it is really nice when Ruth will come in and say, right, Ruth, Steve, can you make a ring this size, like this, put the stone in there. And then, you know, a certain amount of time later, I will I'll, we'll call Ruth in and, and then, then well, then we can, well, Ruth will tell you about what we then do. Yeah. So ba basically when Steve has come up with the, the ring design that I've kind of wanted and the setting that I wanted and where all the stones are going to go, um, I will then get them to print it out for me. Then I can get the customer to actually come up, try the ring on um, before I've even had to touch any precious metal or spend Although obviously there's a cost involved with what Steve's done, but I can do all that before I've touched any precious metal. So it keeps the cost down for the customer. Um, plus they can come up, try it on, don't like it on that finger, don't want that bit, don't want that. I can go back to Steve and we can get it changed. I'm not saying that everything we're going to do going forward is not going to be a traditional technique because um, we still love our traditional techniques. People still want to come and learn about how you know how a, a goldsmith works so we've actually branched out now into another wee area of the business so with our commercial range which is the northern ireland silver and um, all the little iconic pieces we do do corporate jewelry for um big companies that want something to take overseas and um, we're working quite closely with Tour tourism and i invest and i and tourism ireland um so we're also going to have now the um, the Rhino for customers to come up, but we also want to run, or we have started running little workshops for people to come and make some jewellery as part of the creating a memory of when they get a little bit of time out of life to come and make something. So Darren's just going to show you a wee quick video. It's only 15 seconds, so it'll be over in a flash, but it'll give you an idea what we do. So I think maybe that's all from us, Darren, I, if you want yep. to take over. Yep. And well, thank well you. Look, again, you know, very, very great wee business. Um, and and that the, the video summarizes it pretty well to that end of the business, what you do, you know, and it's an event above all else. You know, it, mm -hmm. it, yes, you learn your jewellery skills and you, you get to take pieces home with you in your little bag, but it, it's more of an experience, I find, and certainly I, find, I felt very welcome any time I went to uh, the Stephen Rice house now. So, um, if you're Thank considering you. maybe a bespoke gift for someone, <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> think of a nice silver. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, so basically, what what do we draw down from today's event, really? So, to determine whether or not something is feasible for you, like for example, Ruth Ruth mentioned there, you know, if if, if they design something, some uh, the the end customer can actually come in and. Number one, they can see the design on screen. So 
straight away they'll be able to say, I don't like this, can not be bigger, you know, can this be a little bit smaller, can it change the shape of that? You're always going to have these little niggles, but it's far better you do it at that stage than you go and make the thing out of silver and the customer doesn't want it. Because you've gone through that whole process of getting it to that point. And it's not cheap, really. You know, it's uh, there is some expense in, involved, albeit it's saving you some labor time if, if you integrate the hardware and the software, really, to, to aid your business. Um, it's actually the, the, fascinating the, as well, Darren, just um, even people coming in, they want to maybe change a stone. You know, if they think they want a mm -hmm. five mil stone and they say, I actually don't want that, I want a eight mil stone. Mm -hmm. Just wee things where you and Steve can actually improve that, you know, increase that is so much better for us. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and the, the other side of it as well, if, if it's just to sort of get an idea of the type of jewellery, you know, you can 3D print that in a lesser material like plastic or even wax. And, and that way you haven't spent the money on the precious metal. And I, I think yeah. you had an example as well there, Ruth, of uh, it was like a crest you had done. Oh, yes, indeed. Yeah, so that, that was actually printed in silver that was using height field function in Rhino. So if, if you can oh, see it there, just, get, this, get just, the shine off. Yeah. So yeah. again, the, the, this was this was uh, printed uh, pretty much just from an image that we had we had put together on Rhino. We 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 had the family crest, and we integrated we integrated that into Rhino, and we were, we were able to use that function to actually put it on the, a base plate. And that that was a customer requested piece, wasn't it? Uh, it uh, was indeed. Yeah. Yeah. So. Again, really worthwhile just to see. I, I think the level of detail in that particular case, as Steve said earlier, there was some minimum uh, dimensions that didn't really show up too well. So it, it, it's always good to have someone with a bit of background in the industry that knows, for example, you can't go below 0.2 of a mil in terms of a radius. Otherwise, it'll come out pointed or it'll come out an odd shape. You know, so there, yeah. there is and or rules when, when you're designing the jewellery itself. But once once you're established with these and you know what dimensions to avoid, you have far greater chance of success. Really, is the main takeaway there. Um, so, sort of just to summarize, um, Rhino is cheaper than its alternatives. Um, regardless of your batch of production, it can fit in anywhere. Um, if only you use it for prototypes, for example, before you mass produce something, perfect. If you're making a small batch of things. As opposed to you make using traditional or conventional methods to actually hand carve items out and then you have to finish them and all the rest and you have to approach stone setters all, all this good stuff um rhino can take a lot of the legwork out of this and a lot of the labor time and cost um the the, the flip side of that is obviously the initial time you put in to learn rhino so the the, the juice has to be worth the squeeze essentially and yeah. uh, the business needs to be there um, and in, in your case, Ruth, it is there and because you've sort of diversified your business into workshops as well as bespoke jewellery and having your existing range, it, yeah. it can certainly benefit you in, in, a, in a few different areas, I would say. Um, and again, we, we, we spoke about flexibility of design. Um, if, if you don't like something or you want something changed or modified, very easy to go in and do that on, on Rhino once you get up and running with it. Um, and, and obviously the scalability thing as well. So if, if you know, for a custom thing like a ring, where no no two fingers are the same, basically, um, mm. it, it's it, a couple of clicks of a mouse will scale that thing down. Or if you know, if you want to maybe bore out the the actual slot for your finger to go into, um, that, that's really easy change on Rhino as well. Um, again, one other thing I would mention as well is the fact that. If you're designing Rhino, I touched on the fact that it, it varies from a more parametric style of software in the sense that 3D printing allows you to achieve far greater, like far more intricate shapes. Whereas, like I say, SolidWorks feeds more into conventional methods, I would say. So you're going to generate far more unique shapes by using Rhino. And because that's linked with uh, 3D printing, there's there's less obstacles in the way because you don't need, for example, you don't need a, a spindle head to get in or you know a mill bit to, to come in at a certain angle. And you don't need to reposition the job to work on one side or the other. And the flip side of that as well is you're saving on material because this is an additive process, whereas traditional means are removal. So you're saving on cost that way. And especially if you're dealing with uh, precious metals, 
they, you know, the, the, this is all the more relevant where nothing is wasted. So all of all, all of the costs can sort of be put into the process rather than the, the material itself. So you're more efficient as a business as a result. Um, the only thing so, I would add to that, Darren, is um, in terms of stone setting, even though mm -hmm. you do it on the 3D printer like that, you still probably would have to get someone to set the stone. You know, mm -hmm. it's not so uh, you'd still need a goldsmith to kind of to do that. Mm -hmm. You can mm -hmm. get your diameters of your settings and all correct, but mm -hmm. you'd still need somebody to kind of know, you know, how to get it so that it stays in mm -hmm. that hole. And, and, and I have seen it Ruth, where people are they've actually took a part right out of the printer and, and because you can achieve such tight tolerances on the printer, I've seen okay. it where people actually just pop the stone straight in. So right. it, it, it sort of depends how strong the design is, I would say. In, yeah. in terms of what way you've actually, you know, the, the little legs it's the, the stone will grab onto. Um, okay. you, you can achieve tolerances that should just click them in. Um, so that's something we could look up maybe. Yeah, I was going to <laughs> say. There's an, there's an accession also, service, Steve. Yeah, also that puffer fish thing as well looked quite good, so yeah. Oh yeah, there, there, there's any amount of plugins as well, depending on what it is you want to do. Like what one of the things I I was trying to use only the I think the college laptop was locked in wouldn't let me install it but uh, I was bringing in 2D images to then create 3D bodies with that in, in Rhino so there is plugins that allow you to do that I think okay. without the, the use of a plugin you're 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 sort of stuck sometimes trace you, you can bring a picture in and trace around it so it's a bit more primitive and a bit more laborious in, in terms of actually sketching the the shapes up but it is doable. Yeah, no, this has been brilliant, actually. I think yes. for us as a, as a wee micro business to be able to work with guys like yourselves, you know, mm -hmm. Belfast Met have supported us so much. It's been fantastic. So thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I, look, I, I'm glad you've got the benefit from it. You know, we, we, we love to see success stories. So um, you're, very, you're very much welcome. Um, so uh, in terms of us, the, I think that's all, everything from me, really. If you wish to contact either Ruth or Steve, for any business, I've left their their names up there, um, and this is our this is our sort of marketing spiel. So that's everything for me. Thanks everyone for listening, and over to you, Nick. Thank you very much for that, Darren. I I just uh, I really enjoyed that conversation. Uh, one of my questions was around the limitations, if there are any for Rhino, but that was certainly addressed. And before we move on to the the funding stream, I wanted to ask uh, to Ruth and Stephen. Uh, uh, so, in terms of NI Silver, what's next for you as a business? What are you two looking forward to? Besides winning the cash call of one hundred thousand uh, <laughs> tomorrow, well, we're actually um, the workshops are going so so well with people that um, brilliant. I actually, I, although, but the commission side's really good as well in terms of this whole three D printing thing now because um, we're actually getting well. Steve's getting so confident now that we're getting <laughs> to a stage where. <laughs> We can, I can come in them and say, I want a ring that looks like this. So off you go and like come up with something. So it's almost like our two, like Steve's creative brains different to my creative brains. So sure. it's almost like we're now able to do something different, but it's Brilliant. still us, if you know what I mean. So we're, yeah. yeah. So there's I, I a good think, synergy between the two of you is really yeah, at this yeah, point. Yeah. And I think, I think there is, within the, the Rhino package itself, there is so much I don't know I don't know. Yeah. So, you know, with the help of Darren and the college, I've I've got a level of understanding, but I don't know what else is in there that I, I haven't, you know, ventured across yet. Yeah. Right. So I think it's going to take years, you know, to to get the full potential out of Rhino. And, and look, the, the thing I would say to that, Steve, is, you know, the, the, there's ends of solid, like I use solid works pretty much three, four or five days a week. Uh, I do bounce on the Rhino for more creative end, of, you know, more creative things. But for just your sort of bricks and mortar, working with steel, heavy stuff, it, it solid works for me. And th there's areas and segments and options in solid works that I have never and will never use, most likely. Yeah. But uh, you know, with with obviously engineering and the creative end of things being such a large field, um, someone will use them. But mm -hmm. day to day, generally. There, there'll only be a set amount of things you'll use. So once you gain proficiency with 
you know, whether it be a dozen different processes, that should really enable you to generate more shapes in essence. Yeah, you know? yeah, that, yeah. The lovely thing I think is we've we're starting to get a little bank of designs now that we can have stored online. Mm-hmm. And if somebody comes in, we can say you could have this style of ring, this style of ring, you know, and they can mm-hmm. choose themselves and that they might not know what they don't know that they want. People always come to me and say, I want this. And then when you show it to them, they go, actually, I don't think I do. You know, when they have it on their finger, mm-hmm. they go, I don't, I don't want that square stone. I want a like a heart shaped stone. Mm-hmm. So you yeah. can just change that really quickly. You know, Steve can just go in and swap that setting over and it's no problem at all. So we find it really, really good, haven't we? Yeah, and I don't spend so much time upside down no. as I used to. It's <laughs> back in the real world. Well, no, because you end up upside down and looking at the wrong side of your design in the early days of Rhino. So now yeah. most of the time I can get it to show me where I want to be looking. Yeah. So no mean feet. Oh, well, very Perfect. good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Darren. Thank you very much, Ruth and Stephen. Um, as Darren mentioned, uh, do get in contact with NI Silver um, as they spoke about their uh, workshops as well. Um, uh, we saw that on the video earlier on. Thank you all for joining today. If you would like to learn more about any of our funded upskilling, do get in contact uh, on the email on the slide, please, sensi at belfastmet.ac.uk. Thank you all today for today. And that's the end. Thank you. Thank you, Nick.